Good morning, everyone. My name is Ruth Frazier, and I'm the training coordinator for Evergreen Indiana. Welcome to this Training Tuesday for the Evergreen Indiana Library Consortium, and for those of you who are outside of the consortium. Today's topic is construction and your collection. Today we are pleased to welcome Krista Ledbetter and Jennifer McKinley from Morgan County Public Library. Krista is the director and Jennifer is the assistant director. They have both been working diligently toward the completion of a major renovation of their main location in Martinsville, Indiana. With that, I will give the floor to you, Krista and Jennifer. Great, thank you, Ruth. Um, we're gonna get our screen shared here. Um, as Ruth said, I'm Krista Ledbetter. I'm the director here. I've been at Morgan County almost 15 years now, and I've been the director for 12 of those. I'm Jennifer McKinley. I've been here going on my 18th year and 11 of them as the assistant director. So we we're glad to have you all here with us today. Um, when we created this presentation, it was initially to be at the Evergreen Conference back in, what was that supposed to be, March? Yeah. So hopefully um, we've been able to update it even more. We're farther on uh, with our uh, project than we were then. So we have even more information for you today. And there, there's some Evergreen specific information in here, but there's also just construction and your collection in general. So I think there'll be something for everyone in here. Absolutely. As you guys are moving to the next slide, um, I forgot to, to do this. I know that there are some people in the audience who are either have just come through a construction project, are in the midst of a construction project, or are um, considering one. Can you raise your hands so that we can get an indication of that? Okay, I actually know that there are more than that, so <laughs> thank you for that, okay. Or they're still looking for the raise your hand button, which That's is what true. I would be doing. <laughs> well, we'll go ahead and start just by talking a little bit about our library system in general. Um, so we are a countywide system, um, minus one township, and they are served very loyally by the Mooresville Public Library. Um, we have six locations, three of those full-time um, branches uh, that are open uh, a lot of hours and then three what we deem mini branches that have more limited hours and limited services. Uh, we have 37 employees and we've been part of Evergreen since December of 2009 and it's been one of the best decisions I think that we've probably ever and, made. Yeah <laughs> for our patrons definitely and these are just some of our locations. So our Carnegie Library was built in 1906, <clears throat> and we did a 10,000 square foot expansion in 1990 and a major renovation at that time, um, and then renovated and repairs in 2005. And we're kind of like most Carnegies in a landlocked spot. Um, we have the church has buildings behind us, AT&T has the rest of the block. There were houses around us, um, and we realized what we needed was more space for people. Uh, we didn't have, we, basically every afternoon after school, we're about two blocks from one of the middle schools and we would get anywhere from 20 to 50 teenagers, middle schoolers coming down to the library. We didn't have any kind of designated spot for them. Uh, in our entire building, we had one study room. Um, we had one meeting room that could be divided into two, but we needed that for our own programs. Uh, much less, you know, the public using them. And so what we needed was space for people, not necessarily collection space. Our collection is pretty adequate for our size, but we just didn't have decent spaces for people. So we got kind of lucky um, about 10 years ago, and we bought the house that was next to the library. So that gave us some room to expand to our south. Um, and then right before construction, before we even started our major part of our design, there were some houses or there's a house across the street from that one that came up for sale and we snapped those up so we could turn those into parking and have the full amount of space um, to, for, for an expansion. So we were able to do an 8,700 square foot addition to our library. Um, and that's what it, our slide says it's in progress. But it's, <laughs> it's about 99% done at this point. Back in March, it would have been still in progress. Definitely. <laughs> 
And I think the pictures we're going to see here are some of those in progress pictures. Well, this is what it's the rendering that the architect um, gave us at the beginning. And I remember us all ooing and aahing over it. Um, and if you look to the far right, you can see the Carnegie building, the original 1906 building with the rotunda on top. There in the middle is the 1990 expansion. And then here to the far left is the newest part that we just put on. And here's some of these in progress pictures. So back in March, this is about where we were. Um, the new addition was up, they had the roof on. Um, here they're working on that little bump out. Um, anything else about this one, Krista? That's, uh, you can kind of see how landlocked we are too. Um, all the buildings around us. Um, and the rotunda dome is there at the top of the picture. And you're pretty much standing where this picture is taken. It was actually a drone photo, but it's from basically our parking lots now. So. Did you guys add this, about maybe another third space to that? Yeah, the original, um, with the Carnegie and the 1990 edition, we were about 20,000 square feet. Um, I'd hoped to add 10,000, but we had some challenges with the site um, and the fact that there was an alley that ran next to our building that was never properly abandoned. So we had to do some fancy footwork with the designing the addition and how it attached to the, the new part of the, the old part of the building. So we were only able to get about 8,700 square feet. Yeah, that's still pretty substantial though. Yeah, like I said, almost, yeah. almost another third, or actually it's almost 50% is, yeah, is where we were. Yeah, that's very cool. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. One of our other challenges with the Carnegie building is, um, while we had a ramp into the lower level, it was very hard for people to park, especially if you were handicapped or um, disabled in any way. Um, so this new driveway uh, that you're seeing here allows people to park right in front of the new glass windows and uh, right in front of the new entrance. Okay, so now taking it back. Um, we had to ask ourselves some hard questions. Um, just to get the project going. We talked about already having um, enough space for the collection and not enough space for people, um, but here's how we kind of tried to narrow it down even further. So we tried to find out, you know, how much shelving space do we need just for what we already own? You know, what do we need just to place it back one-to-one? -one? Um, and what part of the collection do we plan to expand? Um, I know Chris and I were talking this morning about expanding our graphic novel section. Um, so those are some things that we took into um, consideration. Um, are we going to change how certain collections are shelved? This picture here is showing our former genealogy and local history area, um, which was very nice and it, and it worked well, but it was not contained in any way. So, you know, when you're dealing with things with family history or local history, um, they're priceless in a lot of ways. They're hard to replace. So we were really looking for a solution to keep this area of the collection more protected. Um, so this is a main way that we uh, really had to change how a certain collection is shelved and housed. We also thought too, um, before the, the move, we sh um, had our genres broken out. We had our mysteries, our westerns, and our science fiction all broken out into, into their separate genre areas. <clears throat> and so we thought a lot about that at that point too. So this, when you're, when you're doing a construction project, this is a great time to just completely blow up your old way of doing things Absolutely. if that's what you want to do. And we ended up deciding to not, to, to take the science fiction collection and start interfiling it with just the regular fiction. Um, mainly because there's so much gray area in some of the sci-fi and fantasy. You have some authors that have books and regular fiction as well as in there, you know, just, there's just a lot of gray area on how those are shelved. So we decided to take this opportunity to just move that part of the collection into the general fiction. But we did decide that the mysteries and Westerns um, had such dedicated readership and those people would be looking only for those items right. to continue to shelve them as their own separate collections. So you really have to have a game plan going in um, for your collection, not just this is where the collection is going to be, but what changes are you gonna make and how the collections are shelved and housed. So part of that formula was my least favorite thing, which is doing the math. Um, if there's a numbers person here, it's certainly not me. Krista is definitely the stronger of the two of us on that. But um, I know I did grow a lot learning how to do these things. So one of the first things we did within Evergreen was just running a report of how big are our 
are our collections as it stands. So how much space do we need just to put what we already have on the shelves back on the shelves in the new area? So that was step one. And I know that sounds really simple, but if you don't do this part correctly, the rest of this isn't gonna work out yeah, very well. It makes it much harder. <laughs> Absolutely. So this may be hard to see, um, but I, of course we're incorporating how we used Evergreen to make this happen for us. So um, you can kind of see here that this is a report. Uh, I'm again, I, more of a novice at running the reports. I do know my basic way around it. Um, but I have also learned too that if you ever need help with a report, uh, the State Library is excellent at that. Mm -hmm. Or just the Evergreen support list, just throwing a shout out there Absolutely. saying, hey, how do I find a count of my items by shelving location? Mm -hmm. And someone will be able to point you to the correct report. Absolutely. And that's basically what we used as a, as a count of um, items <clears throat> by shelving location to run that report. And Absolutely. it looks like you've, you found reports um, that are shared and you cloned them into your local folder? Correct. We okay, usually use so the one from Evergreen. We find those are the most reliable, the admin in there. So, so if so there are those of you in the audience who um, want to use these reports, you'll generally find them um, somewhere in the shared reports um, in Evergreen, yeah. Indiana, um, under these same titles that you see on the screen because um, they were they were just cloned it doesn't look like anything was really changed yeah on that, and so. use, just using the search template block mm -hmm. up in the upper left hand corner <clears throat> is a good way to start too so that's a great place to you know use keywords you know count count of items mm -hmm. shelving location and something will pop up <laughs> and it could be somewhat intimidating but i found it's like anything else the more you play around with it the more you familiarize yourself with it the easier it gets every time i run them. I always feel like I'm not going to be able to get it right and um, we just have so much good support that it, it normally comes through. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So you want to talk about this? Sure. <clears throat> so once um, this we just want to keep talking about some of the functions in Evergreen that we use during our move. So during our renovation parts of our collection were not available. So the very first part of our renovation we, we blocked off a big section of our adult collection and the um, basically our nonfiction was not very browsable. It was on temporary carts, but we knew that we may not be able to get to the items. So we went into the shelvings location editor in Evergreen, and we made our nonfiction collection at that point not um, not holdable. Mm -hmm. So basically, we didn't want to have people outside of our library putting holds on these items and us not being able to fulfill those holds. So the nice thing about this is that you can go in by shelving location. So if you're just doing your a renovation in your children's department, you can just make your children's collection not holdable. Or in our case, we started with a nonfiction collection that was not holdable. So that, that's what we did here. Um, at one point, I think we ended up making everything not holdable. Um, but I think by that point too, we were also shut down due to coronavirus. Right. But like I said, the, the initial ones, we were just doing parts of our collection that were just out of reach for our staff that we would make not holdable. In both of these things, your reports and the, um, the, the, the screen we just showed you are available through this local administration screen. So be familiar with this. Be familiar with it, <laughs> yes. <laughs> you will need to use this. Yeah. Okay, so the other thing that we found while well, we were calculating all the shelf space that we were going to need um, is that we really needed to weed our collection first um, to get an accurate sense of what we needed to move into this new space. We needed to make sure that we really wanted to move all this stuff to a new space. And I'm sure a lot of you can commiserate with, you know, you go out to the shelves and you're looking around and you're like, oh my gosh, how is this still here? We had a lot of that. Yeah. Um, so our best advice is to run reports, weed, and then weed again, and again, and again. Um, you can see these book bins here. Um, they come to us from Discover Books. Discover Books. There we go. They're a very good um, service for recycling books. Um, we found that it really works well with them because they drop off the bins, we fill them up, they come and get them. They don't quite come get them in the dark of night, but at the same time, 
um, it keeps this from being a possible PR nightmare. Um, I'm sure you've all heard the arguments of, well, those are perfectly good books, and why are you getting rid of those? And, um, you know, uh, can't a school use those or whatever we've all heard? Um, this kind of helps you know that the books are being recycled and being reused in a good way, but yet there's not quite as much of an impact on community opinion. Right. And I will What was say the name that of that service again? Discover Books. Discover books. I'm going to put that yeah. in chat just in case people want yeah. to. Okay. And they, they come by about once a month. So when we were at our peak meeting, we were getting four of these gigantic rolling bins a month from them. Um, on, in a normal year, we weed between 10,000 and 12,000 books. And that's just because that's basically about what we order in a normal year is about 12,000 new books. <clears throat> so leading up to construction that year before that, we actually weeded 22,000 items from our collection. And it's, you know, partly just to make our shelves look nice, but partly you don't want to be moving these things over and over again if they're ugly or if they really just need to go. So I can't stress enough how important weeding before you start a construction project is. Michelle has a question. Does Discover Books just recycle or do are they a reseller or? I think they resell and recycle. Mm -hmm. They don't give you anything for it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but, but we were okay with that. Oh, we're okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are perfectly okay with that. So. Okay. Um, and you don't have to do anything special. They will take anything that you've got. So mm -hmm. We, like I said, we, we kind of like them. Absolutely. They've been a good solution for us. Do you have a friends of the library that you had to deal with at all? Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. That's, we, that may we, be another conversation. I think we, that we do have a friends of the library. They, um, when we owned the house that we bought the next door to the library for several years, they would do their, their library book sales there. Mm -hmm. But that house went away. Um, even before we started construction, we went ahead and had it, um, we actually had it moved, not demolished. Oh. Um, so we didn't have a, a place for them to hold book sales from, I would say, see, we started construction in May and it was about October, October, November when the house went away. So there were several months ahead of time and our friends' book sales are not the most effective uh, tools. Honestly, they would, they basically never weeded their collection. So they always had the same books in their book sales and then oh. they'd add more on top of them. And so their book sales weren't super lucrative, honestly. Right. Um, okay. So for us, it was better just to find another route to, to weed our collection. Okay. Um, so Thank you. our, our move, our, our car construction project, we made things kind of really complicated on ourselves. So you can see from these pictures, um, our stacks were, were 90 inches high. And one of our goals in this construction project was actually to reduce the height of our stacks from 90 inch stacks to 66 inch high. And this is in our adult collection. Um, and, but of course, like with all construction projects, you're, you're limited on dollars. And we had heard, um, I think from Greenwood, who had cut down some of their shelving when they had done a remodel that we thought this would be a good idea for us as well. So we worked with our interior designer um, about this and we ended up for the, the new addition buying all new shelving, which as any of you know is insanely expensive. But for our existing spaces, especially our adult collection and our genealogy collection, we were going to cut down our existing shelves. Um, so our, our, our designer, um, we had another problem with as far as our, our collection, because we're cutting them down, it's not just as simple as moving the ranges. We had to actually get the books completely off the shelves. The, the guys, the, the, the book movers would take those ranges away, cut them down and bring them back. So it made it for an even more complicated move, I think, than just a normal remodel where if you're just moving ranges around. Um, and on top of that, in kind of in the midst of this, we lost the program manager from, for our construction project. I think he actually kind of checked out a month or two before he actually left. And we kept pressing him for a schedule for the, the remodel um, at this point. We, we did the addition first, and then we remodeled basically all of our existing spaces. And he kept kind of putting us off, putting us off, putting us off, and then he just up and quit his job. So we were kind of in a scramble when it came to the remodel. And um, our interior designer says, hey, we've got a great guy. He'll do your shelf moving for you. He's reasonably priced. 
and brought him in and um, his work was great. I, I will say that I have had no issues with that. But when it comes to cautionary tales, what we're saying here is you really need to have a good idea of the scope of your project, what you need to be done. And I highly recommend you bid it out to more than one company. Um, this guy kind of soaked us, I will say. Uh, and book moving is not, it's not a cheap prospect to begin with. Right. Um, but when the, the budget our designer gave us was $25,000, I'm thinking, well, that's pretty reasonable. And actually it was less than I expected. But for like every phase of the project, I would get a bill from the book mover. And when it got up to be $40,000, and then we still were only three quarters of the way through the project, I thought, oh my gosh, it's going to be $60,000, $70,000 by the time we're done. So this was kind of my big cautionary table. And, and when you look at our overall project being close to $5 million, again, the difference between $25,000 and $60,000 is I guess not that big a deal, but to me it felt like a big deal sure. at the time that we were basically 100% over budget on our book moving. Do you um, feel like he overcharged or that it yes. was under budgeted? Uh, but yes. <laughs> Both? Okay. Okay. When we came back to our designer, um, we found that she had basically just pulled that number of $25,000 out of the air, not really. And if she'd said that, that I'm just taking a guess on this and that we need to get a firm quote from the book mover, you know, I had, I had assumed because we had firm quotes on everything else that she had presented to us that this was a firm quote as well. And so then when I turned around to the book mover saying, hey, what's the deal here? And he's like, you know, he's, he was a little combative at that point. Um, but I also felt that some of his charges were excessive. Um, they would charge us for basically the travel time of his entire crew, you know, paying them by the hour plus mileage. Um, plus there was just no knowing what something was going to cost. I, I would say how much, you know, I, I, I kept pressing for a final price for the entire project and never could get him to give it to me. So uh, like I said, my caution is just get a quote, make sure you have a firm idea of what your project's going to take and, and get a quote from more than one book mover. Um, because that, that would probably resulted in the most, the most stress I had in this project was dealing with, with my book mover, um, and trying to figure out how much it was going to cost me. Um, but we, what we ended up doing is the, the wooden carts that are shown here on these screens are things that we rented from them. Um, and it, it actually made things kind of nice because you could load these carts up and push them out of the way, uh, while the construction was underway. And, and then we could move, you know, move ahead with cutting those ranges down. And it was kind of nice. I mean, it, I know it's a rudimentary process, but I was very impressed with, if you could look on the uh, right-hand side of the screen, the number and the stick that's popping out. For every card that there was, there was a signifier there. So we could keep track of what was on what card. So, you know, if a patron really needed something, um, we were able to locate it. It took a while, but we were able yeah. to locate it. Okay, in this picture, it shows, uh, if you look kind of on the, the left and upper side of it, there's a temporary wall. Um, our plan during all of this was to stay open for the entire construction. Um, and honestly, I think if we'd attempted to do that, we'd still be under construction right now, and we probably wouldn't have this project done until December or January. Um, if you can at all in any way shut down during construction, just shut it down. Uh, or shut down portions of your building. Don't don't try to remain open. Um, it just makes it difficult for everyone, for our patrons, um, for staff, for for trying to find the collections. Um, and I, I will never say that that COVID was a good thing, but if there is a silver lining, when it came time to shut the library down due to COVID, because it's a public works project, our contractors were able to continue working. And we were at that point probably two to three months behind on our schedule anyway. Um, and just due to the fact that we closed the library down, we were able to just turn the building over to them. We were able to finish this project on time. So my one cautionary table tale is if you can shut it down, do it. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's not a luxury that we can always afford, right. but if there's any way, any way how you can shut your library down and just let the contractors in, get it done. It's just so much better. Okay, so let's show you a few end results. Um, I want you to take notice of the kind of burgundy colored arched curve in the ceiling there. This was everything before. So Krista mentioned the very tall shelving. 
Um, you can see things are a little crowded. Um, you can see a window on the left hand side. That was our only study room. Um, so that gives you a little hint of what it was like before. And then here it is after, pretty much from the same perspective. Um, the window that you're seeing closest on the left um, is where the study room was. Um, it's now gone. And you can see the curved ceiling um, over there now painted white. Everything's really fresh. Everything's really bright. Um, we haven't quite uh, figured out what solution we're going to use for the windows, but I'm not upset with it. I kind of love all the natural light shining in. Um, before, the library always felt very imposing and dark. I mean, it was very comfortable and nice, but yet there wasn't a lot of light in there. Yeah. It was kind of claustrophobic too, I think, with those 90 inch stacks. Um, one other thing we did is a cost saving. When you look at our end panels here, can you go back one slide, Jennifer? Uh, maybe. maybe, maybe not. Okay. Wait, I can. Okay. Yeah. So those are our old end panels and they're basically your, your Demco medium oak end panels. And what we did, okay, go ahead forward and look at them again. These are actually the same end panels. We cut them down and we had them wrapped. So basically when you see like a, you know, like a car that has decals all over it, it's that same concept, except this was just using like a, a wood finish. So we, we wrapped all of our old end panels because again, end panels are, insanely expensive for basically just a piece of wood. Um, so we were able to have some cost savings there too by wrapping our end panels, making them go along with our new decor um, and just reusing all those old ones, just cut them down. And we really tried to do that as much as we possibly could is reuse something that we already had, especially if it was in good shape. We found a lot of creative ways um, to make it fit in though with the new design. When you say you cut down the shelves, so you know the, the 36 inch frame inside those shelves and it's however tall it is. Right. Did somebody actually go in there and like cut yep. them down? Cut them down. The book, it, the, the, the book moving company did that for us. Okay. So, and yeah. they, they finished the edge and things to yep. make it not terrifying. Most of them, most of them have, you know, basically the, the frame is basically just four pieces. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of times the top piece is almost like a cap. It either oh, screws true. on or, or welds on. Okay. So, so they basically just took that cap off, mm -hmm. cut the, the shelves down to size and put it back on. So, um, you know, cause it, it's, it's I, I learned a lot about shelving that, you know, I always thought that like single face shelving that goes against a wall can only be single face shelving. Yeah. No, well, the only just... difference between single face and double face is the type of base you put on it. Exactly. So we had a lot of 66 inch high shelving in our children's apartment already that we just took those and put the, the double face bases on them and, and were able to reuse them instead. So we didn't have to cut down every single piece of our 90 inch high shelving. And as you say that those steel components are so expensive when you yes, are trying to buy them expensive. new. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And I was kind of worried that, you know, cause we, our shelving is, is old. I mean, I think some of it probably dates to the, 50s easily old, yeah. um, but it looks surprisingly good when you just slap new end panels on <laughs> <laughs> and it really goes well with the decor too we had the kind of that putty colored shelving um, so I was really really pleased with how our shelving turned out yeah so another before and after so our program area before was um, in the middle of all the ranks of shelving you can kind of see them over to the left um, so if you did hold a big program, and we've held some big ones, um, the rest of the operations in the library were just completely disrupted for the most part. You know, if you wanted to come in and quietly study during this Bigfoot lecture, you were going to have a hard time. Um, so one of our goals was to make sure that we had a dedicated program area. And here is that. Um, so now we have space for 100 people um, in the lower level of the library. That's where the children's department was before. Um, and we can set it up, as you see here, kind of for, you know, classes or seminars, but it can also be used in, in many different ways. It's very versatile. And the furniture is all very mobile. And you can see we have a little kitchen that's attached there. So we're really looking forward to our programs that we can hold there in the future. All right, I'll let Krista talk about some of our right. new spaces. So this is um, our, in our new edition. Um, I think when we showed you early on that one in shot of them working on the big glass window area, this is what it looks like from the inside. Uh, we're just really thrilled with how everything turned out. There's just so much light. Um, it's real airy, real high ceilings. 
um, <clears throat> just wonderful comfy places to sit, although now with the, the coronavirus, we can't let anyone sit down and all of our really cool comfy furniture is, is, is shoved away into closets and things, but we're just really excited how things turned out. But this is now our children's department uh, with the low shelving. Um, there's two photos here. One is um, just as you come in, the one on the left uh, showing our new, uh, kind of the end of our checkout desk. Um, we've gone with a lot of polished concrete. It has a very modern feel in our new spaces. Uh, on the right is a seating area in the children's department, and those windows look out over the, the entrance and the, and the ramps leading up to the main entrance. And then here's a shot of how things look when it's all completed, our landscaping in, our handrails. Um, we're really pleased that our architects managed to give us a really modern feel to the new part of the building and updating the interiors, but yet when you get into our Carnegie, it still has a very traditional um, old library feel. Sure. And they also managed to meld the architecture between the two. So overall, we are really, really happy with um, our, our project. Um, I know sometimes in the past, we haven't been as happy with some of our building <laughs> projects. Uh, and, I, and we were talking before this, I think the hardest part with us being librarians and doing construction is this is not something we do very often. And there's just such a huge learning curve uh, just learning the construction language, learning you know what our role in this is, learning when we step in and say, hey, this isn't right, or when you have to pull in your architect or your owner's rep. Um, you know, I it, it's been a it's been a really interesting experience, and I, I would say, especially from my perspective, especially during the shutdown, I was here pretty much every day with the construction guys. Um, it was just me and them, and it made life really interesting and different for a while. <laughs> Um, so if you have questions about construction, um, I would say talk with other libraries who have recently undergone construction projects. I would say the other thing that I learned was make sure you get some kind of owner's representative or something that will help you, um, to navigate, navigate um, the different contracts, uh, the navigate the different roles and, and what you have to do. And also I love that you guys, uh, put the, the limestone as part of your, um, exterior to, to blend that in there yeah. the big block limestone it looks yeah. really and nice it's, they use that rough cut to match kind of what's in the Carnegie as well mm -hmm. so yeah it turned out really really nice almost like they knew what they were doing <laughs> right really <laughs> Jennifer what were you saying I'm sorry oh no I, I think the other the thing that I came away with it most is just to have a reasonable expectation about timelines and about just how things will go um, I I get uptight about things often. <laughs> often I get a little worried about, I'm, I'm more of the nervous Nelly. Um, but I, I learned a lot of who to trust and to trust people. Um, and just because you think something should be done in a certain amount of time doesn't necessarily mean that that's the reality of it. And that's, that's hard to, hard to deal with at times. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions? You can either put them into chat or you can use the Q&A or if you have a, a microphone, you may be able to turn that on. Depends on, I'm not sure. Some, in some Zoom modes you can and some you can't, so. Do you guys have, um, I know this is the worst time ever to ask this question, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Uh, ideas for projects away from either your central location or into the future? Or you oh, just yeah. need to, to recover first? No, um, you know, I think that's the, the reality of our, our lives today in the library business is that, you, you know, as part of your strategic planning, you need to be thinking about your facilities and doing evaluations of your facilities. Um, probably our next spot will be our Monrovia branch. Um, it was built in 2008. So it's, it's 12 years old now. It's to the point where it just needs an interior refresh. And that building, um, I was still pretty new here. I was still the assistant director and wasn't very involved with the construction process. And we made, um, honestly, a lot of questionable decisions on that building. Um, 
it, it, it's at the point where we're probably going to need a new physical plant there. So probably just an interior refresh and a physical plant there. Mm-hmm. And then our, our Waverly branch is, is in an interesting location. Um, I'm sure you're all aware of I-69 construction coming through here. <laughs> it's, it's right at the corner of State Road 144 and State Road 37, which will be I-69. Mm-hmm. So it's just west of where I-69 will be. And there's a lot of changes in that area as far as they're putting in sewers. So we expect a big expansion in, in uh, housing development there. So I'm thinking in about 10 to 12 years time, we will probably need to expand that, that branch there. But we've got plenty of time to think about it. Um, and we funded this project partially from a bond and partially just from money that we had saved in our Lurf and Rainy Day. So we'll be paying off that bond in about 10 years time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So about that time is the time we'll, we'll want to take on another big construction project. So I'm thinking that's when we'll do Waverly. And we'll have forgotten all about the stress and pain. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll only remember all the good parts that's by right. then. So have, the you had, yeah. have you had public input um, either during the construction phase or now as you're kind of wrapping it up either about the facility itself or about how you were managing the collections within the facility? Um, prior to construction, you know, we did our, we did our last strategic plan about five years ago and we knew at that time that we, we were already planning on this, this addition and remodel. So we did a lot of focus during that strategic plan um, about the existing facilities and what we wanted to see in the new facilities Mm-hmm. and you know what the public wanted to see. So we had, I think, quite a bit of input prior to the construction. Um, during the construction, you know, there's always, there's, there's, we have plenty of cheerleaders who just think it's wonderful. You know, that you're always going to have naysayers in the community that, you know, think that libraries are extinct or why do we need such a big right. building? Right. Um, you know, it's, there. those people are always going to be there and just remember, you can't please everyone. So let, just let it run off your back. <laughs> exactly. Make it as functional as you can for you and your staff and your patrons and mm-hmm. uh, look towards what their needs are. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think we did that. Yeah. Uh, I, I feel pretty confident in that. I think once we were able to show uh, just some um, security camera footage of how many teens were using the building uh, before or, or after school, um, I think that really brought it to people, yeah. the forefront of people's minds. That, they didn't realize how many yeah. uh, that, kids. In some of our programs, we did like, we took, had still photos of like our summer reading programs where the, we had the, basically the entire adult stack area packed with kids to see um, Indiana Wild mm-hmm. and there's guys holding snakes like just a few feet away from the adult computers. So, <laughs> so we had plenty of, of um, documentation, documentation <laughs> yes. that yes, we needed a bigger space. And I do, uh, you know, encourage you, if, if you're noticing those kind of things in, in your physical setup or in your library, you know, start documenting those things because it, it's one thing to be able to say, well, this is really crowded or this is not working as well, um, but it's another thing to be able to show people. Yeah. So I have a question about this picture sp- specifically mm-hmm. um, from a practical standpoint and because I tend to be a little bit of a troublemaker at times. Uh-huh. Go for um, it. So you have a middle school that is close mm-hmm. to you, and mm-hmm. you have just created a skate park. Pretty much, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so how, how are you going to address that? Do you care? Which Yeah, I, I, I care just for the fact that if it does damage to any of like the planter boxes or, or curbs or things like that, and also from a safety standpoint, because this is a, a fairly busy street, um, mm-hmm. You know, if the kids are going up and down the ramp after hours, I don't mind so much. But, um, but yeah, it's we have signs that say no skateboarding, and you know we have to go out there and talk to them. And um, but yeah, you're right. It's it's uh, it is tempting. <laughs> well, I was going to say, and and I'm the one. I'm like that is awesome, but I see where it's not awesome. But at the yeah. same time, awesome. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. It seem, we seem, don't seem to have as many skateboarders as we used to. I don't know if it's just not so much of a thing anymore. I don't know. Well, not yet. Grown men. I mean, yeah. who knows? <laughs> you this just built, built a new environment for them. Yeah. So. <laughs> I, you know, I'm, I'm also pretty much counting on the fact that this is, it's a fairly high traffic area too. So sure. that it's not, you know, maybe after hours when the library is closed, it could be more of a skate park problem. But when we're open, I think there's going to be enough traffic to deter kids from, 
trying to skateboard here. Now, are you having to increase your staffing levels with that? Um... Interestingly enough, with the way one of our other concerns is um, with our old building, we had an, an upper level entrance that came into the Carnegie and a lower level entrance that went straight into the children's department. And we had checkout desks in both locations. So with this new design, we've actually, so that glassed in area that you're looking at is the new main entrance and the other two entrances are now closed off. Okay. So we, we, we incorporated um, all of our um, checkout or circulation services to that new main entrance. Cool. Um, so we're basically able to have the same amount of staff either between manning that desk and also the reference desk. Uh, so we're, we're basically staying at the same amount of staff. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I have been in your library before mm -hmm. and I've been in the area with the rotunda, uh -huh. which is a very cool area. It is. Um, and what used to be part of the main entrance. So mm -hmm. have you repurposed it into something else utilizing yeah. the coolness of that yes it's now our history and local uh, local history and genealogy space oh, cool so we're capitalizing on that just that that history feel of that area because we mm -hmm. have that beautiful stained glass and we have those big columns uh, we've also carved off a part of it into a new boardroom as well nice. so the, the bulk of it is the local history and genealogy and that's where all, our, all those collections are and we kept the furniture in there has more of a historic old timey feel to right. it. It's um, more traditional. Yeah, much more traditional, mm -hmm. less modern than the rest of the building. Now you've opened the facility to the public. I know you have mm -hmm. limited hours. Mm -hmm. um, how has it been going with the new pattern flows? Um, we just opened yeah. here at the main library last Monday. Was it just oh, no, so Monday there's ago. no <laughs> data <laughs> yet. It's just last Monday. Was it just last Monday? Yeah. Okay, yeah, it was just the 31st. <laughs> It seems like it's been it feels like it's been a year, but it was time is before. strange right now. It is, uh, yeah. and it's gone well thus far. Um, a lot of people are really excited to see it. There is a little bit. I mean, I'm just speaking for myself. It is a little bit anticlimactic too, because I was anticipating us having this grand reopening, and you know, people really being able to enjoy all the spaces and the furniture and. You know, with with COVID, uh, that has definitely changed things. So mm -hmm. right now, we aren't featuring all of our awesome new furniture and, um, and our new study spaces and exactly. new meeting rooms. And things. Right. We're doing what we call grab and go service. Um, so basically we just want people to come in and get their stuff and, and leave. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so it and does seem important anything. to make a point yeah. to, even though it's yeah. kind of delayed to, to do something um, festive when yeah, that can happen. Point. At yeah. some point we're hoping to have a big festive grand opening. Absolutely. But, but for now, it's it's not. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. have been really understanding, and yeah. you know, most of them are just so excited to be able to come in again mm -hmm. um, and to browse for themselves. So I we've had a lot of really positive comments, and mm -hmm. I, I think our community is really excited. Mm -hmm. And even from some of our more persnickety patrons, they they were pleased. Good. <laughs> so your parking is across the street now. Yes. Um, did you work with the city to get like a a bit? I'm going to get this word out. I swear. Pedestrian. A pedestrian walkway. Um, we ha we have not yet. Um, I tried to get a speed bump. They they nixed that because <laughs> they say speed bumps are difficult for snow plows. Fair. Um, okay. There is a stop sign at that corner already, um, and it is a one way street. Although I'd say we have tons of people going the wrong way down it. <laughs> um, so. <laughs> So, I mean, it's not, it's not a terrible intersection already. It's, you know, basically one block from the main street to that stop sign. Um, so right. people can't work up too much speed. Um, and it's actually, you know, when we first started building the lots over there, people were like, oh, you're parking so far away, not realizing that our new door was right there at the right. corner too. So, so I think people are, are starting to understand now what, what, you know, how we were coming from, but I am kind of thinking we may need to put some kind of just crosswalk or you know, at least paint some lines on the pavement um, and work with the city. The city's been pretty good helping us out with our parking and, and other things too. So we have a good relationship. Awesome. We'll get that worked out. Are there any more questions from anyone in the audience? If not, I'm going to say thank you very much to Krista, for, Krista and Jennifer for um, 
this presentation. I thought it was really interesting. I don't have a construction process in the near future, but I love to see what you guys have done and the way you were very thoughtful about your collections, utilizing the resources that you have available to you and being transparent about the, the problems that you did run into as well. One thing that I was thinking as you were talking about book movers and as somebody that has managed a library where I had to move things is there can be a tendency among um, librarians to want to do stuff to offset costs and moving the books would be one of those things where I'd be like oh I'm still fairly young and I can still like muscle mm -hmm. around a cart of books and oh I guess I can muscle around a hundred carts of books um, but it, it was actually very encouraging and um, also a reflective moment for me to say, you know, there are, there are things that you should pay to have yes. other people do. Even if yep. you can do them, it's not your do job. Mm -hmm. You should be focusing on other things. I, I will say that we did use staff to take books off the shelves mm -hmm. and load them onto those temporary carts um, and from the temporary carts back onto the shelves. Um, but we, I have a young and energetic staff who pitched in and knocks that stuff out faster than you can imagine. Mm -hmm. So, um, so we did do some of it ourselves to mm -hmm. help save some money, but we, we did rely on the book movers a lot to do a lot of it. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, again, I'll remind you if there is someone sitting with you paying attention to this webinar that has not registered you make sure to put their name email and library affiliation in the chat box which I will leave open for the next two, three or four minutes you have Krista and Jennifer's email and um, I'll also remind you that our next training Tuesday is in two weeks and it's going to be on communication styles with uh, Sherry Reese from Spencer County, and that is on the Evergreen Indiana calendar as well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Krista and Jennifer. Thank you all. Thanks.